Thank you very much for the invitation. I hope that you are still awake. Uh, as you can see, uh, what I'd like to talk about is the one part of the subtype of stroke. As you've already mentioned, stroke is not one disease. Like you guys, I mean the cardiologists, you have one process to cause myocardial infarction. Stroke is not one disease divided by hemorrhagic stroke and ischemic stroke, but within these two categories, you have subtype of stroke. And one of them is atherosclerotic cerebrovascular disease, uh, large artery disease, cardioembolic stroke, lacunar infarct, small vessel disease, and as it was mentioned, cryptogenic stroke with about 30 of percent of our stroke, we don't actually identify the etiology. So these are the potential uh, sites that may cause strokes, and I'll talk about the intracranial atherosclerosis, carotid plaque, and extracranial atherosclerosis, and the aortic arch. So this is the well we are living with. This is the aortic arch here and this is the carotid system, bifurcation here is vulnerable for atherosclerosis, and the intracranial part, which also less common in the Caucasians, but and more common in the east, east part of the world, but still probably less identified than expected. So we have to tailor our treatment to a particular etiology, it's not one size fits all. And this is one of the uh, problems with stroke. But the common pathways actually is a clot forming either in the heart and going to the brain or on an uh, atherosclerotic uh, wall that, and the embolus that going up to the brain. And for that, we have one treatment is the antiplatelet agents that all this that you're all familiar with, the clopidogrel, aspirin, di diperidomol, I'm not going to dwell on it, but each one has its own mode of action, and therefore there was sometimes attempt to combine them both. And in terms of the guidelines, basically they are all almost the same maybe clopidogrel and the diperidomol plus aspirin, the agronose, a little bit better than aspirin alone. But the ESO, the European Stroke Organization guidelines, actually does not say something about preferential. And the same for the American guidelines that was published 2014. So basically, if you look at aspirin, aspirin offers about only 15% relative risk reduction of stroke, and most wide, but it most widely used between 100 and 150 milligrams, and aspirin, aspirin plus diperidomol, the agrinox, and clopidogrel are basically almost the same. However, as I said, they, each one of them has different mode of action on the, the platelets. Therefore, the question was, if we combine them, maybe we will have an additional effect, like lopidogrel plus aspirin. So, and I'm talking about long-term effect. There were at least three studies, the MATCH, the Charisma, and the SPS3, all of them have shown that long-term combination, DAPT, dual antiplatelet, is bad for the brain. It's not, not it's not, necessarily the same for the heart, but for the brain, long-term dual antiplatelet will cause a lot of bleeding, and including intracerebral hemorrhages, but and not statistically more effective than monotherapy. However, for the long, for the short term, eh, because all these hemorrhages, it was shown that they occur long down the road, after three months, after six months. So people say the most vulnerable time and period for recurrent stroke is the very, either days, 
week or months after the stroke, and therefore maybe we can try dapt dual antiplatelet for the short term and not long term. And uh, this is the Chan star study, the Chinese study that was done on more than 5,000 patients in a small village in China. And it was shown basically that there is a reduction of 32% recurrent events within one month, giving the duct for 21 days, aspirin plus clopidogrel. And uh, we are still waiting for the points results. This is on in the other part of the world, Caucasians and in United States and in Europe. And we'll see whether this will replicate the results of the chance study. And therefore, if it is, will be positive, I think that that will change the current guidelines and will start giving DAPT to our TIAs or minor stroke patients for maybe one month up to three months in order to reduce the risk of recurrent stroke. The question is whether all these agents that I've shown to you that are currently used in, to prevent stroke, in secondary <coughs> stroke prevention, whether we reach the ceiling. The cardiologists, they use anticagrelol as probably the first choice for acute coronary syndromes and, and to, for prevention of uh, acute myocardial infarction. So ticagrelol, is there a need for new players? That was the question. And uh, this was study, Socrates has tried to answer this question whether uh, ticagrelol versus aspirin uh, in acute in, in secondary stroke prevention. It was published in New England Journal of Medicine. And unfortunately, this study has shown there's no difference between us, statistically different and clinically relevant difference between ticagrelol and aspirin. Neither for the prevention of stroke or stroke MI and vascular death. So the question is now, I, what, sorry, but what I wanted to show is that in this Socrates study, if you look at subtype of strokes, it was published by Pierre Amarenko not long time ago, the sub-studies looking at those patients that enter into the Socrates study with sort of, et of atherosclerosis in the carotid arteries based on the Doppler results, it shows that there is significant effect of ticagrelol in stroke prevention in this particular subtype, which means that maybe the patient that were selected for Socrates was not good enough. So what about this, the atherosclerosis in the bifurcation? Tomorrow, I think that uh, uh, Alison will talk about this, but uh, just briefly, there's a, so this is the efficacy, that's what I showed to you about ticagrelol and the effect of the ticagrelol with this particular uh, atherosclerotic subgroup of patients. About statins after stroke, this is part of our secondary stroke prevention a, a guidance. This is based on one study, Sparkle study, uh, using atovastatin 80 milligram versus placebo. It was shown that if you give statins to stroke patients for secondary stroke prevention, regardless of the, the lipid profile, this will reduce the stroke recurrence by 18% and the coronary uh, disease by about 35%. And this is shown that the lower the LDL cholesterol, the better you are in terms of stroke prevention. So definitely, uh, statin is part of our stroke prevention now with the PCSK9. I'm not, it's not the, in the guidelines yet, but maybe we can even go lower with our LDL without doing any harm, neither to the patient nor to, the, to his cognition or to the brain, and we'll see, let, we'll see more of it uh, in, during the years, the next year. So what about prevention 
uh, in, in uh, uh, carotid bifurcation, carotid stenosis. So the question is always, if you have a symptomatic carotid stenosis, to, do we prefer carotid endotrectomy or stenting nowadays? And this is the two potential uh, ways to uh, treat this symptomatic moderate to severe carotid stenosis. This carotid endotrectomy was with us for more than 50 years now, more than 60 years actually, and it was shown that if you have less than 50%, don't touch between 50 to 69%, there is benefit, but for a selected patient, and if you have, a, if you have more than 70 percent carotid, symptomatic carotid stenosis, you have to intervene, definitely. You have to intervene, and this, as you can see here, the number needed to treat is going down if you have 70 to 90, uh, so it's kind of probably was uh, some wrong with the presentation, but 70 to 99 percent, it's number needed to treat it's six endotrectomies, and this is 13. So, and now if you go to the stent versus carotid endotrectomy, definitely in all the trials that uh, actually done and performed to, to differentiate between these, we see that stenting has a more kind of peri-procedural uh, complication rate. And uh, therefore, in the, most, of the, most of the guidelines will say, in Elderly patients, like you see here, stenting is not taken in consideration. In young patients, if you have uh, interventionists who can do it with less than 6%, that's good. I'm not going to go into the guidelines because probably it will be touched upon uh, uh, of this tomorrow. And, uh, but definitely uh, the current guidelines says do not uh, touch less than 50% and above 50%, carotid endotrectomy in the elderly is preferable and less than the age of 70, either or stenting is in symptomatic patients good. And what about intracranial arteriosclerosis? Whether stenting is better than best medical treatment, this was uh, tested in the Sampris trial that actually shown that best medical treatment, aggressive medical treatment, means statin plus dual antiplatelets and lowering blood pressure is better than stenting. And uh, currently, these are the guidelines. And also, if you look at the uh, uh, aggressive uh, angioplasty versus stent, definitely uh, best medical uh, treatment is better than standing. So currently the guidelines do not recommend standing in symptomatic, more than 50% intracranial atherosclerotic lesions. And best medical treatment is better. This is the guidelines of the American Heart and the American Stroke Association guidelines, uh, the current ones. There was a question about stenting versus just angioplasty. So again, the VIS uh, trial showed that there is no, even with angioplasty, it's not better than uh, best medical uh, treatment. Therefore, these are the current guidelines. What about the, finally the aortic arch? I think that the aortic arch is a neglected part of the vasculature to the brain and not much is done to tell us what to do with significant atherosclerosis of the aortic arch, because I think that it's less well visualized. And uh, like the carotid arch, where you can visualize with ultrasound and intracranial stenosis, uh, you do a CT angiography. Uh, but if you have a, and this is the management of patients with the aortic arch, it was shown by Pierre Amarenko in pathological studies and other, and that if you have a protruding plug more than four millimeters into the lumen, this is a vicious plug that may increase the risk of stroke substantially. And these are the plugs that you can see on the echocardiography and the complex plug that may cause stroke. 
So the question is how to treat them. There is no surgery, surgical uh, intervention. The question is whether to anticoagulate this patient versus aspirin or dual antiplatelets. It was a small study done, it's called the ARF study. It was done uh, on a small number because they couldn't recruit enough patients into the study that showed there is no particular difference between warfarin and clopidogrel plus aspirin in these particular patients. This is uh, this is, was adjusted for all these confounders, as you can see here. Uh, so the conclusion was that this, in this particular cohort, there was no difference between uh, anticoagulation and dual antiplatelet. However, when they analyzed the subgroup of patients, when they have the TTR of the, of this, this was done with warfarin, they showed that probably uh, the anticoagulation was a little bit better than this uh, aspirin, the aspirin plus clopidogrel. However, just this to remind you, we're talking about a lot of atrial fibrillation and a lot of uh, atherosclerosis. If we treat all these modifiable risk factors, this was shown in the interstroke study, uh, and we're talking about a large case control study, more than 13,000 patients in many countries, 32 countries, it was shown that if you treat properly all these modifiable risk factors, you may reduce the risk of stroke by 90%. No drug has done it. So I think this is our task. And in summary, stroke is a largely prevalent disease. Ag uh, aggressive risk factor management is important. We should not forget about it. Antiplatelet have almost similar efficacy with marginal benefit for clopidogrel and agrinox. Warfarin is indicated for cardioembolic stroke. We all know with the NOAX. And if you talk about carotid enterotractum versus stenting, the, bene the beneficial effect is shown in symptomatic patients with more than 50% stenosis. However, we have to take in consideration the age if you consider stenting. So thank you very much. And if you would like to learn more about it, come to Chicago in June. It's a nice place, less windy there here. And, uh, we we'll learn, we we'll, can learn more about heart and brain. Thank you very much. So, if you have any question, short question. Uh, thank you for the presentation. Is the uh, stenosis the on, uh, the, the grade of the stenosis or degree of the stenosis? The only factor we should consider in revascularization, you have, uh, I'm uh, thinking about stenosis which are ulcerated, which are ugly looking on the angiogram with uh, high thromboembolic potential. Uh, the guidelines speak only degree of stenosis, but if you do a lot of patients, you see a lot of different presentation of the stenosis. This is a very, Pertinent question, thank you for that, because uh, what we're talking is the vulnerable plaque. What actually caused these plaques vulnerable, if I understand your uh, question correctly? Not all the plaques and not all stenosis are the same. Ulceration, intraplaque hemorrhages make this plaque more vulnerable to thrombogenicity. Uh, but actually, all these studies that have sh was looking into uh, the outcome of these plaques looking mainly on the percent of stenosis rather than the configuration of the plaque. It comes even more important when you're talking about asymptomatic plaque. I was talking about secondary stroke prevention, symptomatic plaques. When it comes to asymptomatic carotid stenosis, for instance, the plaque consistency and the shape of the plaque, whether it's ulcerated or not, probably has more 
to say, I'm not also for the symptomatic patients with plaques less than 50% that we say don't touch. It could well be, and we see a patient with embolic stroke and you have less than 50% stenosis, this is the only potential source of embolism, and say don't touch. Says who? Because we may, in this particular subgroup, the shape, the size, the, the, the vulnerability of the plaque, it's maybe more important than just the stenosis. You're absolutely right. 